Okay, number nine. Number nine really doesn't have anything to do with <coughs> carrying capacity. Um, it really is just a math question. See what you think. Students are studying carrying capacity. They estimate the surface area of a pond to be 240 meters square. Research shows each frog in a pond requires about 2 meters square pond space to survive. How many frogs can this pond support? So really this is just a division of 240 by 2, which gives us 120. Now if we are talking about carrying capacity, we're talking about the number of frogs that this pond can support over an indefinite period of time. So how many frogs can comfortably live there and have enough space and have enough food um, to successfully live there? That's that carrying capacity factor. Number 10, which explains, uh, best explains why cells and zygotes form specific cells? <clears throat> the answer is A. Cell specialization is necessary to form tissues, and I'll tell you why. B. Meiosis requires two cell types that unite to form a genetically unique individual. Well, that's true, but we're beyond that uh, when you're talking about the formation of zygote. A zygote is the initial first cell that's created after fertilization. So you already have egg and sperm cells at that time. So if you look at these pictures here, Stem cells are these precursor cells that can become these other types of cells. But even further, if we go back, um, egg plus sperm cells and fertilization uh, fuse, and then that very first cell is called a zygote. And then it goes through rapid mitosis, and then it starts to specialize. And then we know that that specialization is required to make different tissues, to make different organs for the different organ systems that make up the individual uh, as a whole. Number 11, and we've looked a lot at this uh, recently as we went through evolution, um, but I would say with this one that this question is a really good uh, example of just sticking to the facts, stick to the information that's given, and uh, you'll get these kind of questions correct. Uh, every time. So the diagram supports the idea that chordates, and we've discussed that word chord and what it sounds like, but the diagram supports the idea that chordates, A, have embryos that develop at a similar rate. My question to you would be, do you see anything about the rate of development in this picture? No, because we're sticking to the facts and that's all we have. The diagram supports the idea that chordates develop lungs from gill slits. We see their gill slits, but do we see what happens to them later? Mm, no, because we're sticking to the facts. The diagram supports the idea that chordates develop a tail to maintain balance when moving. Well, we do see a tail, but we don't see what they use the tail for. So we're getting rid of that one because, again, we're sticking to the facts. And then the last one, the diagram supports the idea that chordates have similar characteristics during embryonic development. Well, that's true. That whole statement is true. They have similar characteristics. We see the gill slits and the tail are labeled, and it is during embryonic development. And we see that in the title of the diagram, a few chordate embryos. Number 12 is an osmosis question. Correctly label each beaker. So we have three beakers here, and inside of each beaker we have red blood cells. And our job is to label them as isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic. So I think the easiest way I can help you out with this, uh, two things. Remember that, no, scratch that, three things. Remember that iso means equal. So that means that your second beaker is the isotonic solution. So that means that the percent of solute in the solution and the cell are the same. And so there's no, there's no net movement of water into or out of the cell. It just kind of moves back and forth. The second thing to remember is hypo hippo. Hypotonic cells swell like a hippo. So that means that beaker number three is the hypotonic solution. And then the third thing to remember is hypo and hippo, 
hypo and hyper are opposites. So that then means that beaker A is the hypertonic solution because it's the opposite of what's going on in uh, C. <clears throat> so again, a couple of things to remember here. Hypo, hippo, hypo and hyper are opposites. And then um, isotonic, the water's just kind of moving back and forth at an equal pace. Number 13, which type of organism is responsible for the transfer of energy and nutrients shown in different stages of the cycle? So the energy is through that measurement of heat, that solid line, and the nutrients, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, that's through the dash line. So we know what begins all of these processes. It all begins with plants. So our first box there is the producer. And then producers are consumed by consumers or heterotrophs. And it could be any type. It could be an um, herbivore. It could be omnivore. Uh, it's not going to be a carnivore. It could be a decomposer. And speaking of decomposers, that last box is your decomposer. So your decomposer... And you can see the full diagram on test nav is going to um, take these nutrients and recycle them into the nutrient pool of the earth. So what I have for us to look at again is to remember the recycling of nutrients in those biogeochemical cycles. So the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle both rely on decomposition to recycle nutrients back into uh, the earth. Number 14, looking at our energy cycle here, photosynthesis and cellular respiration are processes involved in energy transformations. Which statement describes the structure that captures energy and creates the molecule that stores the energy? So if I were doing this, I would definitely use my highlight tool when you have a pink and a blue. Um, I highlighted the part about capturing energy and then I went to each of my answer choices and clicked on which one uh, it said. Uh, A and B both say chloroplast captures and C and D both say mitochondria captures. And then the second thing that I highlighted was the molecule that stores energy. So now I'm going to go through and I'm going to eliminate two of these. So who captures energy? We look at the picture there just in case you completely blanked for a moment. Sunlight going into the chloroplast. So A and B, <coughs> we're keeping them and C and D, we're kicking out. So now we have to decide uh, which molecule stores the energy. Is it glucose that stores the energy or is it carbon dioxide that stores the energy? Well. If you look at the diagram, coming out of the chloroplast is glucose and oxygen, not glucose and carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is out. Plus, we know that glucose stores energy. It is a monosaccharide. It is the main energy, uh, energy molecule used to make ATP, or our energy currency that we use to function. So what I have here, just a refresher, <clears throat> to look at photosynthesis versus cell respiration. And here it is just listed as aerobic respiration, just means it uses oxygen. And we could see um, the similarities and the differences. So we could see that photosynthesis makes the glucose and cell respiration uses the glucose. Photosynthesis uses CO2 cell respiration makes CO2. So it's not uncommon to have a question on the SOL about your gases, uh, not just about the energy, but what gases are coming into and out of the experiment. And don't forget cellular respiration. What do you breathe? You breathe in oxygen and you breathe out carbon dioxide. Number 15. A climax community is, and you can see I've already um, highlighted some things, the keywords of either changing or stable. So a climax community is either changing or stable. Well, it's stable. So I'm taking away A and C, and I'm not even going to read through the rest of them. So now I'm looking at my two stable options. 
A climax community is diverse with a stable composition of plants and animals, or a climax community is stable with multiple invasive species of plants and animals. The best answer is B. If you have invasive species like kudzu or a snakehead fish, that might actually cause instability in your climax community by disrupting uh, native food chains and food webs. So just to remember where climax community fits into ecology, it fits in in succession. So succession is that um, transition from one type of community to another. There are two types. Primary succession starts from bare rock. Um, so after volcano flows, go, uh, glacier melts. And then secondary succession starts um, with a climax community that is um, disturbed. Probably some um, natural disaster or, or it could even be human uh, man-made and both of these will start with a pioneer community a pioneer species the first to inhabit the area and primary succession since it only has rock has a very special uh, pioneer species of a lichen that can essentially just live on a rock because it is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae